I say to my defense attorney, well, I might as well get on the stand and try to tell them the truth uh, since nobody else knows the truth but me anyway. And they, their head almost hit the ceiling. They started, got, got in my face and started screaming, you can't do that. In one week, you will be writing you in Angola. So in his strange way of thinking, he's exonerated himself for the actions that he did. And I said that I didn't think he was man enough to fess up to the truth. Picture a dimly lit courtroom, the air heavy with anticipation. The date, August 12th of 2016. It's a pivotal moment in the trial of Felix Vale, a man who stands accused of murdering his wife in October of 1962. The room falls silent as a judge steps into the hushed chamber. The tension is palpable and every eye in the room is fixed on the defendant, Felix Vale. At this point in time, Vale sits stoically at the center of attention. The weight of the courtroom and perhaps the world rests on his shoulders. Before we talk about the verdict, let's rewind the clock and explore how we got here. Felix Vale, a name etched in the annals of true crime, spans decades of enigmatic disappearances and unanswered questions. Imagine a small, close-knit town in Eunice, Louisiana, where the sunlit streets echoed with laughter and the wind carried the carefree barks of dogs that roamed freely. This was the backdrop of Mary Horton's early life, a place where everyone knew each other and kindness and politeness were the norm. Mary was the embodiment of warmth and compassion and stood out even in this sea of kindness. She was born into a devout Catholic family alongside her older brother, Floyd, and her younger brother, Will. Mary shared an exceptionally close relationship with her younger brother, Will. In an interview, Will lovingly recalled Mary as the sister every little boy would want to have as a big sister. She was full of love, light, and joy to the point that it overflowed into everyone around her and into everything that she did. Her popularity even extended beyond her family. She was even crowned the homecoming queen at Eunice High School, a testament to her charm and magnetism. Mary's path was clear from a young age. She aspired to follow in her mother's footsteps and become a teacher. She wanted to make an impact on people and inspire them to do the same. She started going to college at McNeese State University. Her popularity even followed her to college. People were drawn to her, but she only had eyes for one person, William Felix Vale, a man who worked at the oil refinery near her school. She just kind of fell in love from the get-go. I had one woman tell me that Felix Vale looked like he'd been kissed by heaven. He had this very much, this charismatic aura funny thing about Felix, though. I think Felix was the bad boy. Mary's friends say they didn't like him much. Can't remember why. For some reason, we didn't care for him. I do remember that. Felix's upbringing was a little different from Mary's. He was raised on a Mississippi dairy farm. It's a place where cows graze lazily and the earth is rich with the scent of soil and hay. Born to Nell Rose Vale and Ray Vale, Felix was surrounded by three sisters, Sue, Beth, and Kay, along with a younger brother named Ronnie. Among his siblings, Ronnie was known for his kindness and friendliness, a stark contrast to Felix's reputation as a loner. Felix Vale's childhood offered an initial glimpse into his relationship with violence. On the surface, it may have seemed like a typical rural upbringing, but behind closed doors, dark shadows loomed. Felix's early years were marked by a series of concerning incidents involving animals. His family's farm was home to a multitude of cats. These cats were brought in to help control the farm's rodent population. Occasionally, the cats would have kittens. Felix's mom found the kittens to be a nuisance, but did not anticipate that this feeling would spark an odd interest in Felix. Instead of fostering a sense of compassion and care for these animals, Felix displayed a disturbing penchant for cruelty. 
Felix's actions included capturing the kittens, hanging them up on clotheslines, throwing rocks at them to unalive them, bashing them against walls, or even shooting them. These acts of violence against defenseless creatures foreshadowed a deeply troubling capacity for brutality. Researchers and psychologists have long studied the link between cruelty to animals and violent tendencies in humans. This phenomenon is often referred to as the animal cruelty violence link. It's rooted in the idea that violence, whether directed at animals or humans, often origin originates from similar psychological and emotional sources. There are several psychological theories that help explain this connection. One theory suggests that cruelty to animals may serve as a way for individuals to exert control and dominance over a weaker, vulnerable being. This can manifest as a power dynamic that escalates, leading to violence against humans when the opportunity arises. Another theory revolves around desensitization. Engaging in acts of cruelty towards animals can gradually erode an individual's empathy and compassion. This desensitization may extend to humans, making it easier for the person to justify or commit acts of violence against them. By the age of 16, Felix had already become proficient in farming, displaying an aptitude for the agricultural life. At 17, he eagerly volunteered for the military, hoping to become a pilot. However, his aspirations were dashed when his, when his application was denied. In his own words, he admitted, I was not the kind of person who would follow orders. Felix's, sister's, Felix's sister Kay Faulkner recalled him as normal like anybody else during their childhood, but noted that he always wanted to do things his own way, often rebelling against their father's orders, leading to many beatings. The connection between Mary and Felix was nothing short of instant and intense. From the moment they crossed paths, sparks flew and an indescribable chemistry ignited between them. Felix himself described it as a meeting of mental and electrical equals that he had never encountered before. Mary's friends, however, had reservations about Felix. They sensed that something was off, something that just didn't sit right with them. But despite their concerns, they trusted Mary's judgment and showed their support, understanding the depth of her feelings. Mary's family had similar sentiments. Her younger brother, Will, expressed it succinctly when he said, if that was the one that she loved, then we loved him too. Mary's compassionate nature often led her to believe that she could make a difference in people's lives, and she may have seen Felix as someone that she could fix. A year into their whirlwind romance, however, something changed. Mary began to confide in her school friends through letters, revealing a shift in her feelings towards Felix. Despite her initial love for him, she admitted that they no longer saw eye to eye on things. She wrote, I never could break up with anyone. I always keep hoping when there is no hope. These words hint at a growing emotional rift between them, one that would have profound implications for their future together. Mary's visit to her family in early September, just a month before her untimely demise, would mark a significant turning point in her relationship with Felix. During her visit, she confided in her devoutly Catholic mother, revealing her readiness to leave Felix. Her mother recommended that she return home and try to work things out, unaware that this would be the last time she would see her daughter alive. On that ominous day, Felix Vale was off work from his job at the refinery and decided to head to the Calcasieu River. He had a routine practice on his days off. He liked to head to the river to check his trot lines. Now some of you may be wondering, what exactly are trot lines? Well, trot lines are kind of like fishing lines, but they're not just fishing lines. They are long, sprawling setups that can span the width of a river boasting dozens of baited hooks tethered to a main line. Felix was an experienced fisherman. It was a stormy night, but he decided to venture into the Calcasieu River with Mary by his side anyway. They left their four-month-old son, Bill, with a babysitter. The sun was beginning to set, casting eerie shadows across the water as they embarked on this ill-fated expedition. 
As they navigated the river, everything seemed normal until an unexpected twist of fate sent shockwaves through their world. Felix recounted that Mary noticed a stump. He swerved to avoid it, but in the process, knocked Mary into the water. Desperation filled the air as Felix claimed he leapt into the water after her, his heart pounding in his chest. Felix's account grows more chilling with each word. The relentless current was pulling Mary further and further from his grasp. His lungs were burning as he struggled to reach her. It had already taken her out deeper than I could go, he recounted. And when I ran out of air, I came up and went down and did that until I just couldn't do it anymore. The river had taken Mary and all Felix could do was swim back to their drifting boat, haunted by the knowledge that their infant son, Bill, was now left without a mother. The discovery of Mary's lifeless body two days later sent shockwaves through her family. What you guys don't know is that Mary had a deep-seated fear of water. So the story that Felix was telling about her joining him on the boat and then her falling off of the boat, it just didn't seem realistic because Mary wouldn't have gotten into the boat to begin with. There were even stories that her friends from college would tell about how she just had this weird fear, this weird premonition that she was going to die at a young age by drowning. So she did everything that she could to stay away from water. In addition to this, there was also a matter of a life insurance policy that Felix took out just two months before her tragic demise, which added an, another unsettling layer to this already baffling puzzle. Felix was initially arrested in connection with Mary's death, but he was eventually released due to a lack of evidence. Felix had explanations for literally everything. He claims that Mary had gotten over her fear of water. According to Felix, Mary would frequently accompany him on his boat and loved exploring the beautiful bayous near them. He also had an explanation for the life insurance policy. He claimed that it was taken out based on a travel agent's recommendation for a honeymoon that he had planned to Acapulco. He also said that Mary dying two months after he took out the policy was just a coincidence. The police may have believed Felix's story, but Mary's younger brother still was not buying it. Literally, the summer right before the incident, Mary came to visit him as he was doing activities on the river. According to Mary's brother, Mary was still very much afraid of the water, but she gathered the courage to stand on the dock to watch her brother for a few rounds before retreating. She still seemed very much afraid and would not go further than the dock. In addition to all of this, Felix just did not carry himself like someone whose wife had just tragically died in front of him. Mary's sorority, sorority sister, Judy Turney, drove Felix to the funeral and noted that he seemed flippant. He also did not put a penny towards the funeral costs, even after collecting the payout from the insurance money. After Mary's death, Felix and their son Bill moved back to Mississippi and stayed with family for a while. Afterwards, they led a nomadic life, living off of orchards and gathering food. They had little to no possessions, barely any clothing and little to no food. The food that they ate depended on whatever orchard they were staying in at the time. During this time, Felix met a model named Sharon Hensley. Sharon Hensley was the only child to Harry and Peggy Hensley. She was born five days before Christmas in 1948. She was a strikingly beautiful young woman with an aura of mystery. Hailing from Bismarck, North Dakota, Sharon's life was a stark contrast to Felix's. Her youthful charm and radiant personality had made her a local sensation, captivating photographers who eagerly sought her out for modeling opportunities. Beyond her outward beauty, Sharon was known for her kindness and a deep sense of care for her friends and family. She was a multi-talented individual, having danced with the Demonettes and pursued her passion for the arts by attending Bismarck Junior College, where she took classes in dancing and acting. 
Sharon's life took an unexpected turn when she journeyed to San Francisco during the transformative summer of 1967, often referred to as the Summer of Love. During her time there, she gave birth to a daughter, whom she named Cherry after a Neil Diamond song. She ended up giving Cherry up for adoption shortly after birth. Little did she know that her life was about to intersect with Felix Vale, a man shrouded in darkness. When Sharon and Felix crossed paths, her life began to unravel in ways she could never have anticipated. At the time, she was battling not only malnutrition, but also the throes of drug addiction, a tumultuous existence that seemed worlds apart from her early life in Bismarck. Sharon's family had their reservations about her relationship with Felix, and they sensed her fear and inability to break free from his grasp. What was it about Felix that had such a hold on her? Why did she remain entangled in his world despite the evident danger? When Bill was just eight years old, he overheard a shocking confession from his father. Felix admitted to Sharon that he had killed Mary. This traumatic revelation would haunt Bill for years to come. Bill recounts, I overheard him sobbing, which caught my attention, and he told her that he had murdered my mother, and I heard the girlfriend saying, oh, you must feel responsible for it. And he said, no, you don't understand. I really did kill her. At this point, Bill became determined to uncover the truth. This determination led him to a police station. He walked two miles to the police station, stood on the steps, and told anyone who would listen about his father's drug use and that his father murdered his mother. Despite his pleas for help, he was often dismissed. Bill continued to hold on to this belief that his father was a murderer. One detective chose to stop and listen to eight-year-old Bill. He took down the accusations and arrested Felix. However, he did not arrest Felix for murder. He arrested him for possession of LSD. Even though Bill overheard the confession, it was just not enough to bring a conviction. Felix was sentenced to six months in jail for drug possession. Bill's quest for justice took a toll on him. The unsettling feeling about his father and his father's involvement in Mary's death never left him. He stayed with his grandmother in Mississippi and tried to live a normal life. He was in school, living in a home, had clothing, and a reliable food source now for the first time in years. He just couldn't shake his father's confession from his mind. He began to keep a journal of all of the evidence of his father's crimes. Bill's grandmother, Felix's mother, found the journal and tore it to pieces. She told Bill to just let it go. The courts decided and he needed to move on. Bill attempted to move on. He knew from his own experience in court that any evidence he gathered was probably useless anyway. So he started his journey of finding peace. This peaceful feeling changed in an instant. Bill came home from school one day, and as he was approaching his home, he noticed a familiar face in the driveway. As he came closer, he saw that it was his father, Felix. Even more surprising was the woman standing next to him, Sharon. Bill did not harbor any ill will towards Sharon, and he didn't believe that anything that happened was her fault. He just couldn't understand why Sharon would choose to still be with Felix after learning that Felix was a murderer. Bill had a pit in his stomach and wanted to run, but there was nowhere to go. Felix approached Bill and had a small chat to catch up with him. During the chat, Felix told Bill that he did not blame Bill for what happened. He blamed Sharon. Five years after this conversation, Felix returned, but he returned without Sharon. Felix's cryptic comments about Sharon five years ago only fueled Bill's suspicions. Bill believed that his father had murdered Sharon as well. Felix claimed that Sharon wanted to disappear. According to Felix, she was estranged from her family 
and feeling a lot of guilt after he claims her family forced her to give up her baby. She earned enough money through modeling to change her identity and decided to follow through with a new life. Felix claims he last saw Sharon in Key West, Florida. Some years later, Felix moved on to find love again. He met a young 15-year-old girl by the name of Annette Craver in 1981. By this time, Bill was in his 20s and was married. He and his wife found Felix's relationship with such a young girl to be very disturbing. Felix wooed young Annette by striking up conversation. To Annette, he was wise, kind, and caring. She hung on to his every word and did everything possible to please him. In 1983, when Annette was just 17, she married Felix. Mary Rose, which was Annette's mother, did not approve of her daughter's relationship with Felix, but against her better judgment, she allowed her daughter to marry him. Felix and Annette had given Mary Rose an ultimatum. Mary Rose had to give them permission to marry, or Felix and Annette would just run off to Mexico and marry anyway, and then Mary Rose would never see her daughter again. Mary Rose wanted to keep her daughter in the States, so she authorized the marriage. Felix and Annette lived off of Annette's large inheritance. Annette's father had recently passed away, leaving a large sum of money to Annette. After Annette graduated, the couple took off on a cross-country motorcycle adventure. The trip lasted for months. What happened next is disputed by Felix and Annette's mother. Mary Rose claims that, eventually, Felix began to show his true colors. Annette returned home without Felix. She confided in her mother that she had an abortion. Her mother stated that it was unlike Annette to get rid of a baby and that she seemed extremely bothered by what she had done. Annette confided in her mother that she wanted a divorce and to move back in. Annette grabbed her things and left to go live with her mother. According to Mary Rose, Annette isolated herself in her room. She spoke to no one. Felix called repeatedly but was ignored. A little later down the line, Annette announced that she was going to be ready to emerge from her room soon. Somehow Felix caught wind of this, showed up and convinced Annette to let him into her life and to push her mother out. Felix makes no mention of an abortion, but he does claim that Annette did suddenly pack her things and that she did leave to live with her mother. He claims that Annette's stay with her mother was turbulent. There were disputes over money. According to Felix, the instance where he came, showed up and convinced Annette to push her mother out was caused when Annette called him, letting him know that she had locked herself in a room with a 25 caliber automatic pistol in an attempt to avoid her mother. She called on Felix to help her resolve the issues with her mother. Felix came by and talked her down. He then spoke with the executor of Annette's father's will and had the inheritance put into an account that only Annette could draw on. The home was also put into Annette's name. To resolve the issue with her mother, Annette gave her mother around $10,000 to find somewhere else to live. Soon after this, Annette signed the home over to Felix, and she too disappeared. Felix claims that she started traveling with some people from Canada who were traveling south to Los Angeles. Felix claims that she left him as they were in St. Louis camping, and she mentioned that she was going to go to Mexico and leave him. He put her on a bus, and that was the last he heard of her. Mary Rose, Annette's mother, did not believe Felix's story for one second. She became determined to uncover the truth about Felix's involvement in her daughter's disappearance. She began researching Felix and learned of the death of his first wife. At this time, she decided to partner with Felix's son, Bill. Upon meeting Bill, Mary was nervous to even tell him her name, since she shared the same name as his late mother. She also had no idea how Bill even felt about his father at this point. He was 24 at the time, married and starting his own family. She wasn't sure if he would even want to be involved. 
Despite her fears, she mustered up the courage to contact Bill. She told him of Annette's disappearance and that she felt that Felix had something to do with it. To her surprise, Bill agreed with her subs- that her suspicions were likely correct about Annette and that Felix needed to be stopped. She worked with Bill gathering evidence in an attempt to stop Felix. Unfortunately, Bill was unable to see it through to the end. He died due to cancer in 2009 at the age of 46. Mary still carried on. After 20 years of research, she reached out to Mississippi reporter Jerry Mitchell for assistance. Mary Rose provided Mitchell with a trove of evidence, including the autopsy report of Mary Horton, Felix's first wife. Forensic pathologist Dr. Michael Baden reviewed the report and agreed that her death was likely a homicide. Armed with the new evidence and determination, Mary Rose confronted Felix at his trailer, but Felix was not there. She did see that one of the windows of the trailer was broken, so she made her way inside looking for evidence. Unfortunately, she found no incriminating evidence. Her search did lead her to a revelation that Felix had multiple machetes in his possession, but that was it. Although they weren't able to gather any hard evidence on Felix, Mitchell still proceeded with publishing his book, Gone, which delved into the mysterious disappearances and deaths connected to Felix. In his later years, Felix Vale lived a reclusive life in a rundown trailer in Mississippi. After the publication of Jerry Mitchell's book, Gone, Felix became a little more well-known. Felix's story caught the eye of Gina Frenzel, and she decided to take action. Gina lived just an hour and a half away from Felix. She decided to pose as a reporter interested in gathering information about a suspicious fire that had occurred in the neighborhood the previous year. Over the course of several days, she engaged Felix in conversations, recording them with a hidden recorder and taking photos inside of his trailer. Inside the trailer, Gina noted unsettling details, such as a Rubbermaid tote containing a hacksaw and a hammer. She also observed a collection of 13 to 14 pairs of earrings and a bin filled with over 20 journals. While the journals offer no direct evidence, they contain notes hinting at Felix's dark thoughts and tendencies. Some of these notes included him contemplating how to handle situations without resorting to murder, implying that he had likely killed before. So in these notes, he was almost talking himself out of murdering someone and looking for other options. One woman who was mentioned in one of his journals was Beth Field. Beth Field had dated Felix after Annette and she came forward with her own chilling story. She revealed that Felix had become violently abusive, causing severe injuries like a broken eardrum, black eyes, and bruises. After two violent episodes, she decided to leave him. The revelations didn't just stop there. The publication of his book, Gone, inspired many people to come forward. One of those people was Wesley Turnage, an old family friend of the Vales. He disclosed a shocking conversation that he had with Felix after Mary's death. According to Turnage, Felix and Wesley were riding carpooling to work. Felix callously said, my wife wants another baby. She thought if we had another baby, it would help our marriage. I fixed that damn B. She won't ever have another kid. Turnage described how Felix's demeanor transformed from normal to sinister when discussing Mary. Then I got, you know, I had, I had cold chills. Not that I was afraid, but I just realized what kind of murderer I was riding in the car with. So I. I caught me another ride home that afternoon. I didn't want nothing else to do with him. And 
since then I haven't had anything to do with him. I have seen him in and out out here and while he stayed here, but I don't even think I've ever spoke to him. Another friend, Robert Fremont, claimed that Felix confessed to him as well, describing how he killed Mary by striking her in the head on a boat and then throwing her into the water. Despite the graphic details, Fremont didn't believe Felix's confession at the time and didn't report it. Sonny Abshire, who operated the search boat during the hunt for Mary, noticed unusual circumstances surrounding her body's discovery. Her body was floating straight on her side, which is not typical for a drowning victim. The position of her body, the knot in her scarf, and other details pointed to the possibility that she was already dead before entering the water. Forensic pathologists reviewed the evidence, concluding that Mary likely died before being placed in the water. Her scarf was tied in a way she wouldn't even know how to do. Her body was laid in something dirty before being dumped, and she had a large contusion behind her ear. In 2013, Felix Vale was finally arrested in connection with Mary Horton's death. He was offered a plea deal in exchange for information on the other two missing women, Annette and Sharon, but he declined, continuing to claim that they had left on their own accord. Felix Vale was ultimately convicted for Mary Horton's death and is currently serving a life sentence at the Louisiana State Penitentiary in Angola. Despite his conviction, he maintains his innocence. At his sentencing, Mary Rose, who had tirelessly pursued justice since her daughter Annette's disappearance, offered a heartfelt statement. She said, My prayer is that you will acknowledge your horrific actions, seek forgiveness, and strive for the redemption of your eternal soul. The Felix Vale story is a haunting tale of darkness and deception, spanning decades and involving multiple victims. While justice may have been served in Mary Horton's case, the mysteries surrounding Annette and Sharon remain unsolved. For the families of these women, the conviction of Felix Vale for Mary's death brings a sense of closure and justice. They continue to hold on to the belief that the truth will one day emerge, even if the answers remain hidden for now. I'm curious to know what you guys think. Do you believe that there's any chance that there's any truth to Felix's story about Mary or about the other two women, do you think that he may have more victims? Leave a comment down below. Until next time.